So I and Jack uh, uh, led a team of uh, nine of us, including the two of us. The nine of us were charged uh, through the Federal Facilities Council uh, to look at the subject of renewal of the federal facilities. And to do that, the first thing we did, uh, next slide please, is the committee in July of uh, 2019 formed. And uh, the first thing we did was we asked the uh, study chairs for these key recent reports to kind of come back and tell us what did they do and what was their journey and how did they get to a set of recommendations? And I'd like to slow down long enough to say that if you were to uh, mention the 1990 study done by the Federal Facilities Council, uh, committing to the cost of ownership, which the theme of this was, wake up the federal government, uh, you own buildings and owned buildings have responsibilities for uh, maintaining them. Uh, you would come, I think, very quickly to the main recommendation of the 1990 study, which was the federal government should spend somewhere between two and 4% of their portfolio replacement value in routine maintenance and repair. That doesn't mean major renovation, that's uh, routine maintenance and repair. Uh, spin forward about eight years a second uh, committee was formed and looked at uh, something called the stewardship of federal facilities. And in this report, the committee kind of shook the, uh, the lapels of the facility managers in the federal government and said, you ought to be talking about strategic planning. And if I were to rewrite this slide after we have finished our report, I would have said, as I reread the stewardship report, as we finished up our report to compare recommendations there to our recommendations in, the, uh, in our committee report was that uh, this is, how do you get the facilities engineering planning documents embedded into the agency's strategic planning processes? And in fact, uh, I will argue also with the 1998 study was the beginnings of thinking about asset management. Uh, spin forward another six years or so, I guess it's, uh, uh, yeah, six years or so, applying the private sector best practices. This was mid 2000, 2000, uh, 2003, 2004, when the study was being written. And there was a lot of people saying, well, the private sector's got this all figured out. Why aren't you following the best practices in the uh, private sector? And I was involved in this report tangentially because I sat on the Federal Facilities Council as the Air Force civil, uh, Deputy Civil Engineer. And my comment to the study group when they briefed our results to me was, you ought to be looking at not only the best practices in the private sector, but also the best practices in the public sector. The public sector federal, as well as the public sector uh, non-federal, uh, state and local. And then spin forward uh, a fairly large number of years to 2012 and a report I actually got to sit on as a committee member uh, predicting outcomes. And the intent of this report, at least as we wrote it in 2011 and 2012, was to shake the lapels of the facilities managers and say, your story's wrong. You say, give me a lot of money now and I will save you a bunch of money in the future. And of course the budget guys say, hey, that's great, but I don't have the money now. And I won't be around in the future when you say you're promising me to bring me great money back. And so the attempt of this report was to create the uh, analytical basis and the communications structure that would communicate to budget and other senior officials what the outcome would be if you invested in federal facilities. Uh, in fact, the idea was we still wanted the large number of front end dollars, but we needed to sharpen a story how to tell that those investments now will pay later. So now comes the uh, study that uh, Jack and I had the honor to uh, lead the strategy for applying the business case to renewal. And the first thing we scratched our head on and said, okay, renewal. So this 1990 study was about maintenance and repair. The strategic planning study was a little bit broader, but really did focus on maintenance and repair. The private sector uh, uh, best practices were focused on maintenance and repair, and you're kind of getting where we're going here. We had the chance that, uh, if you will, shape not the maintenance and repair side of the facilities managers, bailiwick, but the capital investment or the renewal. Next slide, if I could. 
So the committee uh, come, came up, we had a statement of tasks that was provided to us by the uh, Federal Facilities Council. Uh, we pretty stayed, uh, we stayed pretty close to that, I, I must admit, but we looked at, uh, we developed uh, a, uh, a tasking statement that uh, paralleled this and said, look, we're gonna delve a little bit in maintenance because if you invest in maintenance well, your cost for re renewal may be less. But we also expanded renewal to be talking about renewal, maybe not be just take the building and modernize it to national codes and, and continue to use it, but it may be take that building and gut it down to its, uh, its uh, columns and uh, beams and repurpose it for a whole different purpose than what it was. But whatever you do, you got to build this from a portfolio point of view. And then second of all, our strategies, uh, and we decided there were more than one strategy for this, our strategy for articulating, not only to the federal facilities managers, but to the budget officials, and frankly, the agency operators, because the agency operators are the ones that need to understand and articulate to the larger community, the needs of the facility to meet mission. So next slide, if I could. Uh, Ah, thank you. In our study, the first thing we did was uh, hold uh, a series of public meetings. Those public meetings are of record. There were three of them. Uh, we had 29 different experts from the uh, federal facilities and budget world, as well as from the uh, uh, federal, um, excuse me, from the public non-federal. And by that, I mean, we had state governments and uh, uh, government organizations outside the United States talk to us a little bit about what they're doing in this whole subject of uh, capital investments and improvements. But then we also looked at all of the recommendations from the four studies we talked to you about. And there were about 55 recommendations across all of them. And we binned them at, to look at the recommendations because our, our thought process is, why not write another report that puts out another five to 10 uh, recommendations Let's, let's go and make sure we look and we understand what's been done on the foundational studies. And I'll let you read this list. And I will tell you that you could uh, do a couple things with this list. By the way, the underlying, you can't read the print, it's too small, is the uh, accumulate, uh, uh, com compiling of all of those other studies that were done and their specific recommendations. And uh, they could be put into or binned into these kind of major issues linking facilities to mission, uh, using strategic planning principles and incorporating those into the agency strategic planning processes, uh, communications. Uh, our study spent a lot of time looking at strategic communications, uh, asset conditions, uh, and in fact, predicting from asset, predict, uh, asset conditions, what future asset uh, capabilities will be. Uh, we did not make a recommendation about increased funding uh, but we did make some recommendations with regards to how federal governments could, how the federal government could uh, provide capital funding initiatives. And I'll skip the rest of these for the moment and go to the last slide. I think this may be the last slide. It is the last slide. So at this, it's about 15 minutes left for Q's and A's. What I'd like to do is turn it over. I see from the chat and Q's and A's that I spurred some uh, interest from what were few to many. So Eric, over to you. Hi, this is Mike Fortinaro, uh, communications director for the ALN. Uh, Eric Brown had to step away, so I'm gonna step in and uh, um, we were fortunate to have Bill Brote from uh, NASA join us. Bill, if you can turn on your uh, camera, that would be great. But before we go on to Bill, I'd just like to say, Mike, you have a way of consistently making the complex simple and understandable. Very much appreciate that. And I look forward to uh, being able to see the full report. So thank you for uh, guiding that uh, complex project. And Jack Dempsey. Yeah, that was a team effort and uh, I and you had a great segue. So where are we in our report? Uh, the report's been submitted to the National Academy. It goes through a peer review process and we're waiting for that peer review process. Over and to you, Mike. When it comes out, we'll love to uh, have a full session on that. And, and Jack, uh, your listing of what has been happening recently actually gives me hope 
that people in the federal government are listening to uh, the global approach to systematic thinking uh, towards managing an asset. Uh, so thanks for that. And, and Cameron, uh, the value to the nation that the, you're providing is uh, significant. Thank you for sharing everything you're doing there. So now we need to give Bill Broad a little bit of uh, equal time to explain some things about NASA, but also uh, give us insight on what NASA is looking at in terms of asset management. Uh, it's actually uh, quite exciting. Bill? Thank you. Um, I happen to, Jack's uh, slide of showing the progression of things, I go back to about 1988 with the <coughs> Federal Facilities Council, and I can say that NASA pays a lot of attention to the reports coming out of the Federal Facilities Council and the uh, uh, parent organization, uh, the BICE. Uh, much of the work in uh, building information modeling came out of the Federal Facilities Council. And many of the people that have been involved in asset leadership kind of transitioned from building modeling, which was uh, not just a 3D modeling, but recognizing that all of the information over the entire life cycle was what building information modeling was all about. Now, take this to NASA. NASA was involved in ISO 9000 very deeply long before I came to NASA, but I was in the federal government. And NASA really, really adopted it. And our entire uh, governance structure, we call them uh, NASA procedural requirements, was based on the ISO 9000 work. We dropped uh, dropped ISO 9000 as a requirement, but that vestige is with us. We are in active with uh, an environmental with ISO 50,000, and I have been tracking the work with 55,000 and APA 1000. I can say that in general, we follow the principles, uh, but if you look at our history, I thought in 1958 that NASA was a brand new organization. After I came to NASA, I found out that wasn't the case. It was mostly cobbled together from military facilities with a few new places. And the histories of each of the organizations is embedded in our culture yet today. So getting a one NASA view has been a struggle since 1958 and is continuing. We are presently undergoing a major reorganization. I mean a real reorganization, not just change the titles. And it will do a great deal to bring that one NASA uh, about, which has an impact, a good impact on portfolio management. Because traditionally it was each center circling its wagons and wanting to get its fair share. And anytime you deviated from the fair share, there were many repercussions for the, from the, the headquarters facilities people were in an awkward position. We, don't, we, we didn't control everything. Um, Regarding our work right now, uh, the, the slides uh, mentioning uh, uh, reduce the footprint are very interesting. I was engaged in setting up that initial reduce the footprint emphasis on uh, offices and warehouses. Honestly, I did it because I didn't want anybody looking at our other facilities, which is where our real money was. And I was successful in that. Uh, but unfortunately, I think the government's spent too much attention on counting square feet. Once we got rid of our vacant facilities, and we had a lot of them, it gets very difficult to consolidate because it means people have to be moved. You have to have money to renovate facilities. There's just many complex decisions. We are in a very good position right now because every one of our NASA centers that has submitted a new master plan has 
achieved our target, which is a very aggressive target for reducing our portfolio site by site. But we are now establishing an agency-wide master plan. So the, the, every master plan will have to conform to the agency mission, strategic plan, and the funding limitations, because that's been a real problem. You can have a master plan, great vision, but do you have any chance of getting the money you need to achieve it? Uh, I think now, in the last couple of years, we're seeing master plans that are much more in line with an achievable budget. Uh, we fight the scientists and engineers who want to throw things into space. We rarely get beyond that, but if we do get beyond it, we'll get cut out uh, uh, by OMB and may, and, and if we get beyond that and get up to Congress, you know, we're fighting other committees, uh, other, our appropriation is part of a large, larger pie and we have to, we have to fight with uh, our share of that. So it's not an easy uh, posture, but we're aiming at a very substantial reduction. Now, one way to get that in portfolio management that we have an, adv uh, an advantage of, we can rent out our facilities and retain the income. It doesn't go back to the treasury. Now, there's ins and outs of what can and cannot be done, but the general principle is we are renting out our facilities at a, a phenomenal rate over the last few years. You see these uh, SpaceX and Boeing throwing stuff into space from our, our launch sites. They're paying for that. And they are building things and they are, are using facilities that we no longer need. But we don't have any way to record that in our reduce the footprint. So the innovative approaches to facility management that are sometimes available to the government um, our, our common simple metric isn't picking up. I guess bottom line is we are in principle following the ISO 55,000 concepts. I don't think we've reached a point that we're ready to go forward with the additional steps that would be needed to become certified, uh, but we're doing some very attractive, uh, exciting things. You see them, I see them when we launch something, uh, but it out on the ground, there's some very good work going on too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And I just want to let everybody know that this is such a dynamic uh, panel that uh, we will have a uh, official end at the uh, half hour. But uh, for those who can stick around, please continue because uh, we will uh, continue the discussion. And I want to start, Bill, by asking you if you could share something that you shared with me while we were preparing for this about the fact that other uh, organizations, other uh, NASA asset categories are also looking at ISO 55000. And is this some way that you're helping to break down barriers between the different uh, asset groupings at NASA? Uh, well, as part of the transformation, there's some barriers that have been broken down. Um, like I have sat across the hallway from the chief information officer staff for several years. I never talked to them. But now we've established hackathons and digital transformation activities, and we are now engaged with people at our centers, myself and a few others at headquarters, with the chief information officer looking at uh, strategies to which will have an impact, a big impact, I think, on our facility operations. That just didn't occur before. We were uh, a pyramid structure. 
and it was difficult to cross those lines. Uh, we have another project going on right now that I uh, JPL brought to the table and I got it going. We're looking at our building information modeling and looking at uh, object model attributes, the information that we would like to have for life cycle facility management. This translates, of course, into cost of operation, because if you have the right information at the right time, you can reduce the cost. It's, I've been aiming at this for 30 years. The work started at the Federal Facilities Council in 1990. It was the subject of two major events. It was carried to the National Institute of Building Sciences. And actually, a lot of money was spent on it from many agencies contributed. But it's now, 30 years later, some of the aspects of it still aren't implemented. Uh, it was a bridge too far. We got partway. Now we're going in and trying to cross the rest of the bridge. Excellent. Uh, these are exciting things. Yes, that's very exciting. And Nick, uh, will you come in and show the slide of our member organizations? And for those people who have to leave, um, we thank you for joining us. And for those who stick around, we're going to start with a comment from Vince Carter from DHS, who uh, joined us uh, recently. So uh, those were the organizational members. Uh, we thank them because without them, we would not be able to do this. And this is very exciting. So um, Mr. Carter, if you can, uh, would you uh, like to make some statements about what you've heard and what you're doing at uh, Department of Homeland Security? Mike, I, uh, I'm pinging him and maybe he's away from his desk. Okay, so um, I will uh, got that one instead to Jack Dempsey. Jack, can you uh, make some comments about activities at Department of Homeland Security, publicly available information? So I, I think I think uh, Department of Homeland Security kind of spoke well for themselves. Um, what I, I found really interesting is they're, they're almost kind of like a, adult age now. They've been around, I, I think Mr. Burgess kind of made a point there, the youngest department. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting, you know, having been a, a former member of the Department of Homeland Security, um, kind of exciting to see how they're they're progressing. Um, so I think it's really exciting to just just see what they're doing. And I think um, I think what they're doing is also echoing in lots of other places. Um, you know, Bill's points on D uh, on, and NASA um, are similar in terms of I think there's a curiosity out there. There's uh, obviously a lot of uh, need to figure out how to kind of pull all this together. And there's a lot of solutions that are evolving and developing. Um, I think in terms of uh, asset leadership network and what you're doing, um, there's a convergence here. Obviously this, uh, this group is uh, oriented towards asset management and the broader uh, promise of what asset management and discipline asset management provides uh, in terms of you know, standards-based approach and, and other things. So I think from a just a, a private uh, tax paying citizen. Um, it's exciting to see the federal government um, thinking seriously about this and uh, looking to um, make things better. So I, I think that's probably a good summation of, of what I heard and saw at the, uh, at the panel today. Excellent. Uh, David Pakuar, are you still available? Yes, I am. So can you comment on uh, what you've heard um, that's developing and how that might uh, be helpful? Sure, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I would echo really what I'm hearing kind of across the board. We're all looking to make progress um, and to, you know, have a system work, make that incremental improvements. Um, I think the, some of the challenges that were pointed out there about, um, you know, metrics and a lot of the metrics, for instance, reduce the footprint and it's, Obviously, it's easy to, to default to, you know, what's the number, but so often there's so many things that are very nuanced, um, especially when you have portfolios that are largely, you know, diverse and not all office space. Um, data quality is something that I've heard kind of re reoccurring across the board. 
Um, you know, overall, you know, I think we're all working and moving in that direction um, to make progress, but uh, it's going to take time. I definitely uh, think, and uh, I know that we've um, done that internally within DHS is to leverage those best practices. GAO made recommendations around, around the structure. We've got the ISO 55 as, as uh, a framework and, you know, leveraging that the the last thing that i'll know is um what omb puts out really you know that's really our action items those are kind of our taskers when we get um directives from omb to you know work on that that's really what pushes the button and that's what really uh moved us forward um within um, dhs so um hopefully you know as a federal community we can all uh, make make progress moving forward Excellent. In terms of the federal community, uh, Cameron, if you're uh, available, there is a question that is about uh, international best practices. And I wonder if uh, you're looking at other countries or other sources for uh, some of the insights that you're gaining. The Federal Facilities Council itself um, because everything is tied so closely to the budget process and to guidelines and and, and uh, policies that are issued by the federal government, it doesn't hasn't really looked at internationally what what other countries are doing. I do think in some of our studies and in, in, in the case of the renewal study uh, and past studies, they we we do look at, at what European countries are doing. I know Australia and and and. Great Britain and, and, a, and a few other countries have a, a very robust asset management programs uh, of, of their public infrastructure. Uh, one of the di uh, uh, differences between the country, a lot of it is, is about who owns the infrastructure, um, whether it's public infrastructure or private infrastructure, or some sort of pseudo public private um, infrastructure ownership in there. And I think a lot of the asset management um, uh, policies and processes from a, from, a, from a public standpoint are about that ownership level. Jack may, I, I know because of Jack's involvement with some, some international standards development, may have a better um, valuation or, or description of that. Yeah, Jack, can you comment? So, yeah, so uh, in, in the capacity, uh, I'm involved with ISO 55000, full disclosure uh, in a leadership position, and I convene the product recruitment work group there. So we look at uh, across the world, um, kind of what's going on in the area, area of asset management. It's not exclusively physical infrastructure, uh, but, it, but right now there's probably more energy in the physical infrastructure aspects um, in terms of that. Um, and I think Cameron kind of uh, made a good point. Um, um, you know, asset management is a lot about the value generated by the assets. So the um, organizations or the stakeholders, whether they're rate payers in terms of they need water, you need a, a good working transportation system that you're dependent on, um, and assets um, involve things beyond that. There's IT assets, there's, um, you know, uh, brand reputation, you know, like, hey, when I buy um, a certain quality of product, I expect it to be good. That's an asset, you know, in terms of the trust. So assets, Assets uh, go a lot of different places, but it gets down to um, what does that um, stakeholder value? Um, if it has a lot to do with um, resiliency and uh, uh, you know energy initiatives, such as reduce the footprint, reduce the carbon footprint, and that's valuable to the organization, um, that becomes part of that thought process. If it is more about, you know, kind of, you know, resiliency in terms of being able to respond under a whole range of different um, circumstances, and DHS is, I think, is a good example of that as a as a responding organization. They they have to, um, you know, think about these things when they when they're formulating their asset management program. So the asset management standards, ISO 55,000 standards, is a management system. It's not a how to manage your assets better. It's basically, here's a series of um, good management practices that have been distilled down from all around the world in terms of a systematic approach of how to manage assets. So that's kind of like the, you know, the ground rules. Now on top of that, and I think you know, Mike um, talked about it in terms of the study that we just 
completed and still still not published, but it's decided out the door is, you know, strategies to renew federal facilities um, really um, revolves around the definition of two words in that. Um, renew, which is more than just do maintenance and repair. It's, you know, keep things moving and think about it on a portfolio level. And um, we found out there isn't just a single strategy. There's strategies. There's strategies on how you manage your assets. There's actually strategies on the value of how your assets, um, you know, uh, generate. And, um, and, and I think, you know, the more personally I learn about asset management, the more I understand there's some basic elements to it. And the more you learn that, I think I personally found the more helpful it is to, uh, or, or easier it is to apply, but more helpful it is to the, uh, to the end user, the stakeholders. Are you getting a bigger ROI out of it, basically? So that leads to a couple of questions that I'm gonna combine that uh, focus on measurement. We've been talking about the, the big picture, but what are the actual specific measurements of for individuals, for organizations, you know, even energy savings, or what kind of measurements are good to look at for realizing the value? I'm sure it's different for each situation, but uh, Jack, if you can address that in general, maybe David uh, could say what some of the measurements are that the uh, Department of Security is looking at. Well, I'll give it an like, initial point is I mean, there's, there's, there's some obvious ones condition. Um, I think Mike was talking about, or maybe DHS just talked about like functionality, you know, there's, there's different kind of performance metrics of, you know, what are your specifications? Um, <clears throat> resiliency, um, GAO has a number of reports that came out. I mean, Keith, uh, I think uh, talked a little bit about it, but Amelia, who was another speaker at different formats, uh, talked at more at length about resiliency and, um, and, and what that means. So measures are many, um, stakeholders are many and their interests are varied and uh, complex. So there's lots of measures, but ultimately it gets down to, you know, almost kind of like a willing buyer, willing uh, seller, seller premise, the kind of the economics is, if condition is really important to you, then you're gonna spend money on it. And I think, um, things like the uh, American Society of Civil Engineering uh, report card, or the fact that you know we're, we're managing things at a condition index that is too low or not or, or lower that's in an uncomfortable way. Um, I think the engineer probably thinks about it that way, but um, honestly, if the end consumer really values the condition, um, the condition goes up. And I think, example, a lot of um, public federal public spaces, if it's um, public facing, and it serves a purpose in terms of functionality, bringing people together, you're going to find the spaces there probably maintain better. Whereas, you know, the warehouse where you're parking the old, uh, you know, lawnmowers, not going to be managed in that way. So there's, I think there's kind of like an economy there. And I think that's representative of what asset management is really, really about. So it's, it's probably too complex a topic to, to cover in, in one specific area, but the stakeholders will tell you what's important. And if you can find ways to describe the criteria in terms of a scale, you have a performance metric. David? Sure. It, yeah, yeah, if I, yeah, let me just add on. So um, absolutely, I, I can echo everything that Jack's saying here. Jack's, uh, we worked a lot with Jack. Um, so on, on the DHS side, so what we focused on were uh, metrics that we um, can get um, the data for. So obviously there's, there's a lot of different metrics that you can apply over here. Um, we're primarily focusing on the condition index, no surprise there. Um, recapitalization rate is another um, uh, metric that we use. Utilization rate, um, operating cost per square foot. And we also are um, looking at, you know, asset maturity, um, which essentially looks, I'm sorry, I should say asset management maturity, which primarily focuses on the, um, the dollars that could be found in the budget that are tied directly to the um, asset management plans for the real property capital plans that um, we put together. So um, there's multiple metrics. We, we, we're trying to work primarily off of data sets that already exist, which are founded on the FRPP. 
Um, but yeah, it's having, having, there's not one KPI out there, obviously, that um, is going to answer all the questions. Well, um, Bill, there was a comment about uh, many organizations that are being certified are being certified to ISO 55001 for their personal property. Can you address how your uh, NASA facilities are working with your personal property and IT property? Are there ways you're helping each other? Honestly, uh, that's one that I can't say much about, except that it for years I was trying to get a a, a, a re, the reporting capability to identify personal property assets that were associated with a real property asset. It took five years before we could get the personal property and IT people to use the real property asset number. Now we have that and I've been, been engaging in discussions uh, with our master planners and real property and personal property people about looking at the total value of the asset we're protecting, which is not just the replacement value of the real property asset, but it includes the people, which is the dominant cost, and the personal property. So we have $12 billion worth of personal property, and it has been completely ignored in our real property capital planning decisions. I think it's getting into the equation now as, as a component of total cost of ownership. We have been looking at the O&M costs pretty well. But, and, and we have a great record in terms of safety of our employees. That's a big deal in our culture. And believe me, I, I am confident regarding COVID that they're not gonna ask anybody to come back to work uh, unless they can provide the best possible safe conditions. Uh, that's a big plus for us. But getting these other factors in is just now getting into our culture. Well, thank you, uh, Bill, for all your years of uh, work on that topic. It's admirable that you spent five years getting that to happen. And uh, Jim Dieter, uh, CEO of the ALN, would you like to comment? Yeah, I mean, I just, I was uh, going to raise my hand with that same sort of question, Mike. You know, so Jack Kelly had mentioned the, the personal property topic. But I worked, uh, uh, Bill, I don't think I knew you, knew you then, but uh, doing NASA support work at around Goddard Space Flight Center from the uh, uh, early 90s into the early 2000s, uh, you know, both for from a contractor perspective and managing, uh, providing people to help with the management of government, uh, government assets on, you know, on the facilities. Uh, and it was always frustrating from the personal property uh, management perspective of trying to get all these pieces together. Uh, one NASA contractor that I worked for at one time was working on three separate asset management systems, you know, both methodologies and software. One for uh, company-owned capital, uh, one for government property, and one for IT assets. And nobody, they looked at me like I was crazy when I said, so we should have one system that covers all of this stuff. Uh, and I think you know we're on the path now uh, where those kind of important questions can be answered. I was just to summarize it, you know, when I got some attention in that direction, I would say things like, so if the building burned down, how would you know what was in it? <laughs> so uh, glad to hear that you're making progress on identifying the assets to the buildings. That's awesome. And Jim, would you like to uh, make any summary comments before we conclude? Oh, uh, this is great. You know, 
I've had the good fortune to do some work uh, personally myself, again, as I said, with NASA and, and with Homeland Security. Uh, has been uh, so it's very interesting to work with those organizations. I can say that uh, I know that the personal property uh, procedures at DHS, uh, I haven't seen them recently, but uh, I helped write them at one point and they were based on uh, ISO 55,000 concepts before the document had been published. So uh, may or may not have too much distance to cover there to, to include those. Uh, but I particularly want to take this time to thank Cameron and uh, representing our association with the National Academies uh, has been uh, remarkable uh, and highly beneficial to uh, the mission of our organization. And, uh, you know, I see it making an impact to the uh, mission of the National Academies, which is greatly gratifying and, and to the efforts of, of, of Mike Imani and and Jack Dempsey and, and others in that direction. So uh, you know, very much thank to them and thanks for everybody that uh, all the panelists today and for the participants. Uh, so uh, I think we have some very useful information here uh, that we can all go back and look at as we, as we share these videos and various pieces of the videos uh, online. So thanks Mike and good job by you too Mike. Oh, thank, thank you. And thank you to the Department of Homeland Security that gave uh, such a comprehensive view of their asset management approach for real property. It's uh, very uh, helpful and we hope other agencies are able to benefit from that. And uh, Bill, thanks again for your efforts at uh, NASA. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you as the progress is made at unifying uh, an approach to all asset management there. Thank you. All right. I'd have to say thanks to Nick. <laughs> Nick has been uh, a, a great uh, addition to have Nick, you know, really enabling, you know, our speedy and uh, I won't say seamless, but, uh, you know, very expeditious transition from uh, a real in-person real-time event to uh, a real-time online event. So thanks, Nick. It's been my pleasure to be a part of it. Well, thanks, everybody. And thank you to all of you who have stuck around for this. Uh, we appreciate your attention and your time. Bye for now. <laughs>